I'd ask you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4. Reading the first 11 verses. Temptation of Christ. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, then he became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will give his angels charge concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. I have a personal conviction that we tend to give assent, nominal assent, and to mention when appropriate, but not to thoroughly think through the glory of what's revealed here and its significance for our own walk with Christ and service to the kingdom, the better to appreciate the Lord Jesus Christ. I remind you that in that great invitation in Matthew 11, Christ says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, learn from me. And the older I get, the more I'm convinced that the cornerstone, if you will, this, the centerpiece of our learning scripture, of studying the word, should have at its clear preeminent center the person and work of Christ and understanding that in order to know him. It's so easy to learn about Jesus without learning Jesus. I believe it's a very common trap to the devil to give us a temptation that we don't recognize in confusing learning Christ with learning about Christ. Learning about Christ is crucial, but that is not the same as learning him in a relationship. Remember in that great ending of the Sermon on the Mount, he says in Matthew 7 that many will say to him, on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not do that? And he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So the real intent of my service in terms of my service to you in terms of preaching this morning is to encourage you to know Jesus in a relationship that's radiant, that's rich, a relationship that's obviously life-changing. So what about this temptation? Well, the context matters because if you cast your eyes back for a moment on chapter 3 at the end, we find that being driven into the wilderness occurred right after Christ was baptized. And a voice came out of heaven and the Holy Spirit descending on him as in a dove, as in the form of a dove, 
And the voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And in uh, the other gospel account, as the words, listen to him. So this is important. And it really should be understand, understood as the beginning of his ministry as the second Adam. And that the way he dealt with the temptation has some remarkable parallels to Adam's situation in the garden. And that can be, I think, instructive. Would you turn to Romans chapter 5? Romans 5, beginning with verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, how much more did the grace of God and the gift of the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, come or abound to the many? And the gift is not like that which came through one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgressions of the one, death reigned through the one, speaking there again of Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. And then one other text on Christ as the second Adam, if you will. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 20 and reading through 22. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those that slept. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And then verse 45 of 1 Corinthians 15. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, so also are those who are earthly. And as the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So the term, the second Adam for Christ, I believe is very helpful. And if you think about what we know about Adam personally, not descriptively uh, by a, a later writer of scripture, but from the Genesis account, the most that we know about him is that he, was, along with Eve, was involved in the fall and how that happened. And the simple and yet eternally significant horror of what they did will continue to the rest of human history and indeed the record of it into eternity. So after a season of blessing, in which Adam and Eve lived in the garden, and obviously in great comfort. They didn't know that they even needed any clothing, so that the temperature control was perfect for those of you that perhaps are tempted to overly depend upon air conditioning. He had to overcome a very simple temptation, which was to eat the fruit. Now, there was some precursor preparation in Satan's wickedness because he tempted Eve to see it 
as good to eat, su suggesting or implying that the rest of the fruits in the garden were not good enough to eat, and then suggesting that it would make one wise. So she was tempted to desire status above that which she was given in the garden, and Adam, of course, agreed in these perceptions since he ate right after she did. And the desire to know something or to know a field of experiential knowledge God did not want them to know, which was to know, of course, good and evil, but with the perspective of a corrupt, spiritually dead heart. And when they ate the fruit, they died spiritually at that instant. So if you think about it, here's Adam and Eve in the garden, and it's paradise. Everything's just right. There's perfect environment in the garden. No discomfort, no sickness, no injury, nothing to discomfort them. Plenty to eat, everything perfectly arranged for their well-being, and they yield to the devil's temptation. Now think of the contrast with Jesus Christ. Jesus was driven to the wilderness, led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. No lush surroundings, no abundance of fruit. And then as part of the fulfillment of the tests that Christ had to meet, he voluntarily fasted for 40 days. Adam and Eve did not come into the temptation of the devil with a hungry tummy or their uh, feelings of, of hunger famished. I believe that God took Christ to a very limit on, on fasting. I can suspect about you, I don't know unless you and I discuss it, but have you ever fasted for three or four days? And if you have, do you know what you think about a lot? Food, food, food. And not only that, but our hearts are so corrupt that if we fasted even a day, we can be tempted to feel pretty good about ourselves because we denied ourselves that little bit. And Christ fasted 40 days. Now jump down, please, to verse 11. The devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. And if you recall, in the Garden of Gethsemane, angels came and ministered to him after he had prayed to the point of shedding blood from his forehead. So this is a good evidence of the severity of his circumstances. So when we're hungry, we can be vulnerable. A tiny snapshot of that is if you go to the store, men especially note this, when you're very hungry, you will probably buy things that your wife doesn't want you to buy. And in fact, it's a matter of social knowledge. You shouldn't go shopping, major grocery shopping, if you're very hungry. So you probably will not make wise decisions. So Christ was severely deprived of food and rest that he needed angelic ministry. So do you think that that's, you can say, a pretty good evidence that his condition was serious, that it required angelic ministration. Adam had perfect fellowship and Eve. Christ had only, as Mark tells us, the fellowship of the wild animals. Adam had perfect surroundings. His environment was flawless. Christ's environment was the hardest outside of being on a life raft at sea after your ship has sunk. I think the next most serious hardship of environment is to be in the desert. And if you've ever been 
in great distances on a desert, you can know that it can be a lonely, forsaken place and not a pleasant place to rest. And we, I think, can suspect he had no comfortable bedding. Not only that, Adam came into this day of temptation surrounded by blessing. Christ came into that day of temptation bearing the curse of Adam and of all his descendants. And Adam came into the garden a stranger to hardship, into the garden location where he was tempted more correctly. Christ had been facing hardship from his birth, from being born in a stable, growing up in a low-income home in a poor region of the country, Jesus Christ did not have an easy time. And now as his public ministry beginning, he has to face the temptation of the devil. So what about Satan's temptations? Well, the first we know was the temptation to assuage his hunger with a miraculous change of stones into bread. And if you ponder that, it's sort of interesting as an insight into this issue of temptation because twice Christ took bread and supernaturally multiplied it. But it was for the benefit of others. Crucial difference. Christ was tempted to miraculously produce bread to benefit himself. And then the second temptation where the devil tempted Christ to throw himself off the temple roof was a temptation to be in rebellion against God's providential government and the truth of his word. And the third temptation was a temptation to commit this death of the human race by just one moment of worshiping Satan, which would have put Christ in this situation of being sinful and hence unable to be our mediator, our redeemer, our Lord. So the temptation was powerful, but there's some additional nuances of it. In the first two temptations, he says, if you are the son of God. And I think we properly should understand that is said in a sneering contempt. And the difficulty of living with that can maybe be appreciated a little bit when we think of Peter watching Christ walk on the water and when Christ tells them to not be afraid, Peter says, if you are the Son of God, tell me to come to you on the water, if you are the Son of God. So the heart of Satan's temptation began with a strong, contemptuous expression of doubt about Christ's deity and tempting him, tempting Christ to be defensive. And again, if you think for a minute, when somebody misrepresents us, we know it's untrue. Isn't our first reaction to step in immediately with a defensive response? And when we're falsely accused, sometimes it's not obvious and sometimes it is, that we do far better when we step back and wait for our Heavenly Father and our beloved Savior and Good Shepherd to defend us rather than we ourselves. The devil tempted Christ to rely upon physical relief more than spiritual feeding. He tempted Christ to put the physical first and the spiritual second. He tempted Christ to avoid the burden of suffering and the call of God for Christ to be matured through suffering. Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 9 and 10.
Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, comma, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. I think we do well at appreciating the justification involved in his death. But look at verse 10. For it was fitting, was suitable for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, that's redeeming unsaved elect people, to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering through sufferings. If we would appreciate and understand and love Christ, not discounting but con contemplating well on his sufferings is a crucial part of entering into fellowship with him and, as Paul puts it in Philippians, the fellowship of his sufferings. Satan tempted Christ to doubt his heavenly Father's providential care to doubt it, and to abuse it. Satan tempted Christ to, devout, to doubt the sufficiency of Scripture. And Christ highlighted the sufficiency of Scripture, especially in resisting temptation by quoting Scripture that was appropriate from Deuteronomy in each of the temptations. He highlighted the power and the sufficiency of Scripture in the worst of circumstances, in the most difficult. Satan tempted Christ to corrupt the application of Scripture, such as throwing himself off the temple roof and turning the stones into bread. That would be a corruption of a good application of a great truth. Satan tempted Christ to commit idolatry and to worship him ahead of God and to put his own thoughts before the thoughts of God. Satan tempted Christ to misuse his place of spiritual preeminence and privilege of being the beloved son of Almighty God. Satan tempted Christ to replace faith in God with presumption against God. Satan tempted at Christ to believe that God doesn't punish sins. I tried to think about what it would have been if Christ had given in and yielded to one of those temptations. And the catastrophe for the race of Adam would be beyond description. It would just be incredible. I can't even begin to adequately think it through. But clearly... That was a temptation to not believe the way of God that he had agreed with the Father from eternity. And then I think we can sum it up by saying this was a clear temptation, and the third one particularly, to avoid the cross. To avoid the cross of God. Everybody who worships the devil that is not saved, Satan says, just, just, just for a moment, bow down and worship me, and it's all yours. And as Satan lied to Adam and Eve in the garden, of course, that was a consummate lie to begin with because the kingdoms of the world weren't his to give Christ in any case. So what of the glory of his responses? Well, I believe that he gave a marvelous example of dealing with temptation using Scripture. And when you walk away from this worship service today, if you have come to a firmer understanding or have recommitted to your understanding that God's Word is sufficient for every matter of life and doctrine, you will have done great honor to our Savior in his entire ministry, but especially and particularly in appreciating what he did for us there in the wilderness. 
He did it by quoting scripture. He put obedience ahead of his own suffering. And he resisted the satanic trap to become focused more on defending himself than serving kingdom righteousness. He proposed to Satan the perfect response to Satan's wickedness. To pick scriptures that applied directly to the temptation and to exhibit a spirit of humility against the devil's consummate arrogance. So, beloved, what about this for you and me? Well, I submit that the suffering of Christ in the temptation is not simply a theological artifact. There's an application. If you believe that this was important as part of his full messianic ministry, it's a call, first of all, to be thankful. And this evening we're going to consider the issue of gratitude and thankfulness. But I believe that this is the place to start with a clear view of the tremendous importance of gratitude. Jesus did this for every single believer that would ever be. This morning, if you are sitting here and with sufficient evidence from Scripture that you are saved, you can say properly and should indeed that Christ suffered the temptation in the wilderness for me. It was his perfect fulfillment of the burden that was put upon the first Adam and rejected, Christ perfectly carried. Now, a second principle is that if you really believe that we are called, as Paul says in Philippians 3, to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings, you cannot justly omit the suffering in the wilderness when he was tempted. And Paul says clearly in Ephesians and Peter in 1 Peter that Christ is our example and we're to follow in his footsteps. So not only is this an occasion for thanksgiving, it's a call to deal with this temptation as part of, here's the quote, following Jesus. And I would ask you this morning, in thinking through the issue of personal application, do you think you have a visible, observable walk of following Jesus? And not only in your speech and your actions, but in your thinking. Are you jealous for the preeminence of Christ? Because it's marvelous and applies in everything. Do you think that you can see in this that there is power in the scriptures? The word of God is powerful. It's so powerful that Christ elected to use that rather than his supernatural power to cope with Satan's most evil temptations. Can you see the high calling that Christ put on obedience to God? And that he used scripture to remain holy and to protect him from corruption. Christ clearly, even though this may not seem really obvious at first blush, Christ clearly showed us that the misapplication of Scripture is an evil, for Satan clearly tempted him to misapply the word for his own benefit. And then I think, finally, this is a call to see in Jesus Christ his selfless love, not just at the cross, not just in the garden, but throughout his public ministry, and beginning with it in its first days of being witnessed by the Jews 
and the Judeans and the Galileans. So Jesus Christ, in resisting the temptation of Satan, suffered so that you and I can live, not just in the cross, but throughout his public ministry. May God give us the grace never, never, never to trivialize or quickly sweep past the temptation of Christ. Amen.